Good afternoon. Welcome to the museum. Um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about my research, but let me start with who I am. Um, I'm Georgi Jankowski. I'm a, a professor of molecular, cellular, and developmental biology at the University of Michigan. I run a research lab on the fifth floor of this building. That's where my research lab is. And um, I also teach undergraduate students and graduate students, but um, today I'm going to be talking about what my research lab is doing. Uh, we study DNA and how that fits into our bodies. But before I start talking, let me introduce the people who are, whose research I'm going to be talking about. Well, that's me sitting at the microscope. We love microscopes. I have two right here. And we like to look through microscopes to see the secrets of life larger. Here's my lab group, um, some of my students, and Sarah actually just showed up. She's right here, my graduate student and some of my other students sitting at their own microscopes. So together, we look into the secrets of life through the microscope. But what is it that we want to study? Let me give you a little bit of a background first. Our bodies are made up of cells. Actually, quite a few of cells, quite a few cells. They are tiny. I have this image here, is what a human cell might look like if you look through the microscope. But those of you who are curious, here's actually something pretty similar to that. There's a microscope slide, tiny little microscope slide. You can look through it, or if you don't feel like getting up, you can see what's being shown right here. So on that tiny little slide, just zoomed into a tiny little spot, is this. These are my cells. I just prepared a microscope slide right before coming here. There are four cells here. Uh, this is what our bodies are made of. This is an example of our bodies are made of. How many of those do you think it takes to build a human body? Trillions, in fact, uh, 37 trillion, well, about, I think that's an estimate. So cells are tiny. We have many of those in our bodies. What's inside those cells? So, so you look inside those cells, there is a tiny little blue spot in the middle, an even smaller blue spot in the middle of the cell. That blue dye that I added to these cells um, turns DNA blue. So what you have in there is the part of the cell where DNA is stored. It's called the nucleus. So the nucleus is that even smaller little blue dot in the middle of the cell is the nucleus. And inside that nucleus is our DNA. Who has, not, who has heard of DNA here? You've heard of DNA? What do you know about it? Dynamic, it's very, it's, it, it, it can change. A lot of things happen to it. It's within our bodies to determine who we are. Like, my hair is this color because of my DNA. I turn out to be this height because of my DNA. It, it determines what we look like. And so it takes a lot of information to determine everything about you. You know, how many arms do I have? How many legs do I have? How high, tall I should be? How, everything. So it takes a lot of DNA. In inside, ev inside every human cell, if you took the DNA out of it, out of the tiny little blue spot, you took it out, it would be this long in one human cell. How do we do that? If you were faced with the task of putting something this long, much, much thinner, but if it was as thin as, I can't show you how thin it is much thinner, but this long, how would you put it inside a tiny little compartment? What would you do? Roll it up. Roll it up, exactly. Do you want to help me roll it up? You can, you can both help me. I actually have two here. So in, there are proteins in our nuclei. This is a little model from ping pong balls around which we roll up our DNA to make it shorter. So here's one DNA for you, one DNA for you. There you go. And I'm going to give you four of these to roll it around, and I give you four of these to roll it down. Do you want to take four and roll around the DNA? Mm -hmm. So this process of packaging DNA into smaller things is happening in our bodies. That's how so much DNA can fit into such tiny little space. Um, 
while our little volunteers are helping out with the process. So this is the process. You take the long strand of DNA, wrap it around proteins, those, to make it shorter. And then this is just the first level of packaging. We keep packaging them. Once you get a, a smaller, a, a shorter piece of DNA fiber, you wrap it into other structures. Very good, good job, thank you. Keep going. But then, this tight packaging presents a problem. When I had that piece of DNA in front of you, if you wanted to do something with it, DNA's job is to, to you, so that you can do something with it. If you want to do something with it, you can't get to it. It's so tightly packed around these proteins that you just can't get to it. It, it, it. The solution presents a problem itself. Now what do we do if I want to get to it to make my eyes or make you know, the pigment in my hair? I have to get to that DNA. And so this is where we start wondering as scientists, okay, so DNA is packed into those tight little structures. Give a hand to our volunteers, thank you. Very good job. So if DNA gets packed into such tight little structures, how do we get to it? And so we start asking questions. Is all DNA the same? Is, is all of it exactly like that? Or, or some of it, the part we want to use is different, it's more accessible. And so that's the process we need to study. What parts of, what happens to DNA, how they are packed, and what does that packaging do to them? Now, I have access to human cells, you know, I have four right there, but it's just not as many as I would like to study. So instead of doing this study, these studies in human cells, we use a tiny nematode, C. elegans. Uh, this is a bigger C. elegans than in reality. I have the actual version here. Can you reach this? You want to try? <laughs> if you look through there, what do you see? Oh, wow. Uh huh. <laughs> it's interesting. Okay. So, what, what do you see? Pink dots everywhere. Pink dots everywhere. Anything else? Do you see something moving? Let me see what we see here. Uh, hmm, I don't see anything pink, but I see lots of spots. That's right, but do you see anything moving? No. No, okay, how about here? Can you look now? No. Well. Can I stand? <laughs> <laughs> if your parents want to lift you up. So those of you who are brave enough to walk up here, or maybe after the presentation, if you look through that microscope, what you should see is tiny little worms, about a millimeter in length. Uh, they are called, so if you look through the microscope, it should look like this. These tiny little worms crawling around, you should see some little eggs. Those are the embryos that they develop from. They, gen their generation time is three days, they go from you know, a worm laying eggs to their eggs now becoming adult worms and laying eggs. And so that's the organism we study because although the magnitude is different, the question is the same. It takes about 1,000 cells to build the body of one of those tiny worms. And inside each of those cells, there's about two and a half inches of DNA. So something that's a millimeter in length has a thousand times two and a half inches of DNA inside its body. So different magnitude, but still the same question. And then we can start wondering about how one piece of DNA is different from the other. And so the one piece of DNA that we study in my laboratory is the X chromosome. These worms, just like us, have males and, um, well, not quite like us, but so we would have males and females in humans. In these organisms, we have males and hermaphrodites. The hermaphrodites are, well, they are both female and male. They are making both sperm and oocyte. In fact, they can self-fertilize and produce eggs. But there are two sexes, just like in humans. And just like in humans, those two sexes have different numbers of X chromosomes. Females in humans have two X chromosomes. Males have one. Hermaphrodite. Uh, little worms, C. elegans, their name is. Uh, they have two X chromosomes, and males have one. How many X chromosomes do you have? Two. Two? Excellent. How about you? 
You have, I think my guess is one, yeah, one. just one. But the point is that no matter how many X chromosomes you have, those X chromosomes are doing the same work. Let's think about their DNA. So I did the math yesterday, I was counting. So if you, we have six feet of DNA, um, about four inches of that is uh, the X chromosome. Two inches of that is um, in, in males. So we have different, um, different um, lengths of X chromosome DNA in male and female cells, two inches in females, um, four inches in females, one inches in males. And for the little C. elegans, they have 0.4 inches of X chromosomal DNA in hermaphrodite cells and 0.2 inches in male cells. Again, we are talking about you know something this big in something that tiny. So we have, this is what we have in terms of X chromosomes. But the point is whether you have four inches of DNA, of X chromosome DNA, or two inches of X chromosome DNA in your nuclei, they have to do the same job. They have, the, the job is the same. So if there is some reflection of the job and the DNA packaging, the X chromosomes are an excellent place to look because we have different numbers doing the same job. And so in my laboratory, we look inside the cells of these C. elegans worms and look at their X chromosomes. This is now we are looking at not these cells, these are human cells, these are now C. elegans cells. I blew them up even bigger. What you see, in fact, is only the nucleus, only the part of the cell where the DNA is, and you see the X chromosomes in red. Hermaphrodites have two X chromosomes, males have one. Do they look different? Yes. Okay, in what ways do they look different? What, what difference do you see between this X chromosome and one of these X chromosomes? In here, two okay, little pink stuff in here. One big one here, exactly. See, this is how scientists make observations. They look at it and say, well, there's two little and one big. But each of these little things has the same amount of DNA as this one big one. So even though the DNA amount is the same, one of them is more loosely packed. Like let's make this one the big male X chromosome. There you go, it's going to be huge. and the other one is smaller, even though the DNA, the length of DNA is the same. So this is one difference between the X chromosomes. These are smaller, these are bigger. Well, we scientists, we like to use fancy words. I don't know why, but we do. So we call these condensed, because they compacted into a small place, and these we call decondensed. So we made one conclusion that Hermaphrodite X chromosomes, even though they have the same DNA, they are smaller. Male X chromosomes are larger. What else do you see? Now I'm looking at cells in a different way, and I tell you in a second in what way I'm looking at it, but do they look different to you? Anybody else would like to say what difference they see? Do they, but, but what else do you see as a different? Exactly. This one is green and this one is red. Good job. And now, the what? It's still the male X is still bigger. But what we did here, we did a different experiment where we used um, a dye that only binds to the chromosomes if they have a certain decoration on it. Now, I don't have the decorations on these little proteins that package the DNA, but you can put little chemical groups on it. And if the chemical group is present, this green dye is going to bind to it. And this green dye only bound the hermaphrodite X chromosomes and not the male X chromosomes. So we found little chemical tags that are only present on one and not on the other. And the later research in our lab showed that those little chemical tags are in fact responsible for pulling the DNA together. So they have different decorations. Last, can you see another difference between the hermaphrodite X chromosome? So again, you're looking at the nucleus. This is a hermaphrodite nucleus, this is a male nucleus. You have the two small X chromosomes and the one big. Can you see any other difference? Yes. The male is wider than the, than the other. It is wider. Uh, it, it's, uh, 
is that what you meant, like wider this way? Okay. Um, so that's part of the being big. It is definitely wider. It's also like wider in every dimension. Now, let me give you a hint. If you think about their location within the nucleus, can you see a difference in that? Yes? But where is it within the blue space? Kind of on the side and like it, the and the center. So these guys, these tiny little compact chromosomes are not only small and decorated with chemicals that make them quiet down, they are also shoved to the outside. And the male X that's doing, there's only one, but is doing the same amount of job. It's bigger, it doesn't have those modifications that shuts them down, and it's in the center of the nucleus. It's, it's uh, downtown while uh, the hermaphrodite X is out in the suburbs. It's kind of like real estate. Location is important. Size of the house is important, small versus big, and then decorations are also important. So these guys are out on the periphery. This is in the center. So scientists, we draw conclusions. Our question was, how are these X chromosomes different from each other? Well, so now we know that the X chromosome that is in hermaphrodite, so there's two, not too many, but there's more of them, so they, need, they do less job. So if we want to shut them down, we can condense it. We can take this, the DNA and shove it close together. We can put the little chemical modifications that make them not function as highly and move the whole thing out to the periphery of the nucleus. If you want to make the opposite with the um, male X chromosome, we can decondense it. We can remove the repressive chemical tags and we can move the chromosome to the center of the nucleus. So that is the conclusion we drew from our research and from research of many other people in the field, that it matters how condensed the DNA is, it matters where it is located in the nucleus because it will determine whether it can be uh, used a lot or used less. That's what we do in my lab. And if you wanna take some time, I invite you to take a look at our worms and look through the microscope to look at human cells. <laughs>